Now please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Cullen. My name's Cullen and I'm an alcoholic. Hello. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of speaking at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings before, but I have to tell you that this feels a lot different because I think I know I, know I have the capacity to be honest tonight. And uh, when these two young boys walked in, I was like, thank God they're here because I can totally just relate to that age because that's literally about how old I am. I was so lovingly um, told outside that uh, I could give a cake to somebody that I've always really respected um, on Sunday and that I could take my Weiner chip. So uh, that says a lot about my sobriety. But, uh, you know, I... <laughs> I really like, I've, I'm blessed, I'm just blessed. And I know that it's really hard to sit in these rooms and listen because I do it too and I have a really hard time doing it sometimes and it's okay if you guys don't hear me, you know, maybe somebody will, maybe somebody won't. It's not really about me and uh, that's, that's pretty new to me too. Um, it's, it, <laughs> it's funny, like, I love the people in my life that are in recovery so much because they they just sh they treat me with love and the way that they do that is they they just act like themselves and what that's done is allowed me to be where I am literally tonight and uh, and I'll, I'll hopefully get to that soon because I'm actually scared and I'm just gonna admit that but uh, um <laughs> I had a really good friend tell me that I stopped drinking and started thinking and just the other night he told me after one of my great epiphanies to go back and get the 20 questions for alcoholics and take out drinking and write in thinking. And sure enough, for every 20 questions, I had like a sure enough answer how like thinking has ended me up in a hospital and institution and a sure enough answer for how drinking has ended me up in an institution or hospital or jail or any of those other things. And I was just like, God, I have to start stop thinking. So immediately, what have I started doing since that day? As I, I started thinking what I was gonna say at this podium, and about a minute ago, I lost all of it, just blank. And I'm just like, uh, okay, go with the flow. Like, no, I don't know. But I, 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 I can laugh because what I actually know is like, kind of where I come from. Everybody's like, well, how did you get to be an alcoholic? And I'm like, well, my great grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My father is an alcoholic. And how I got to be an alcoholic is my mom was like a budding Al-Anon member and they had horrible sex and I was the winning sperm, I guess. And here I am, you know? I, uh, I literally blamed my parents up until a few hours ago. Honestly, I swear to you. I mean, I, I I'm being dead honest right now. Um, and I and I had it. I I had a very spiritual experience about two hours ago, and it it's been happening for like 36 hours. And of course, I have to speak on New Year's Eve, and I'm like, oh God, just like so funny. You know, my my higher power is just he's he's a clown, and he likes to play with me, and it's funny now. You know, because I can laugh at the jokes too. I used to. I used to think that I was the the butt end of like the worst joke ever called my life. And uh, when I was about one month to two years old, I was in and out of the hospital with fatal illnesses. I was allergic, my mom calls it sensitive, to substances like milk, you know? And I mean, I literally died three times before I was two and I just found all this out in sobriety. At age two, I got suspended, or from age two to five, I have no idea. From five, I got suspended because I was chasing this kid that was chasing the girl I had a crush on, and I bit through his shirt, like right on his nipple, made his nipple bleed. I totally blamed the kid, got suspended. It was his fault. He ruined my, my preschool and my kindergarten, held it until I was 21, still blamed him. You know, like elementary school, I, uh, I begged my mom to go to, to public school. Education is really big in our family, and uh, I hate them for that even though I'm almost educated. But I went to this public school and like, I, I got my ass kicked 
all the time because I'm the light-skinned black Indian-looking kid. Nobody knows what I am, so what do you do? You beat him up. And I'm just like, that's me, you know? And in, in, in middle school, I begged to go to a private school, and thank God I did for this one reason. I, I picked up, like, a lacrosse stick and... And when I was really young and I got into into middle school and all these poor little white kids that didn't look like the black kids that were beating me up just got hell taken out on them because it was their fault that I got beat up three years ago. And, and you know what? I got recruited into high school for it. So I don't know. Do things happen for coincidence? Does everything happen for a reason? Is, is everything God? Is it all my fault? I don't know. I don't know anything. You know, I'm really just winging it because I lost my notes in my head. My so, you know, but so I go to high school and like my family would tell you, we don't know what happened. You know, I came out of high school, 4.0 GPA, like student athlete um, on the on the dean honors roll, all this other stuff. I was talking to a friend two nights ago and she was like, if you could have heard, she was a little bit younger than me. If you could have heard the things that they used to say about you at school. And I'm like, like what? And you know, it's like how much I can drink. Like, you know, all the freshman girls come in and I'm a senior and they're like, have you met Cullen yet? And you know, probably then I thought it was really cool, but they're like, stay the hell away. Like he's nuts. Well, sure enough, it's true. Like by the time by the time I was 20 years old, I have been 51 50 15 times. I've been arrested five times for, for all pretty violent crimes. Never went to jail strictly on it. I always talked to cops into taking me to the hospital. I was always going nuts. I didn't want to have any responsibility, and it was always my parents' fault. My parents are bad to me. My dad's one of us. I think he probably saw the answer a long time ago. He's like, yeah, I have no responsibility for that. You're on your own. My mom's the codependent. She's like, I'll raise him and save the world. And my mom has been my higher power for so long that it, it's, it was like crippling. And then thank God for AA. Thank God for the men in AA. Thank God for the women in AA who just like so gently burn me with real information so that I have to look at myself and take my whiner chip because I've been whining for 18 months and finally coming to the realization that there actually is a higher power of my own understanding and of all these accomplishments and all these failures that I've had in my life are mine. They're mine, you know, because all the time I'm blaming everybody else, you know, for, for all these horrible things that they did. I never got to look at my own accomplishments, you know, and it's one of those things that I'll, I'll be telling my kids like, yeah, I could have been this and that. But I wasn't, because I wasn't, and I didn't want to. I mean, like, that's a real good story. You know, it sounds a lot better with, like, a bullet in my leg or something to really blame about, but I can't, you know? But I did. I, I, I'm smart, which is a curse in Alcoholics Anonymous, because you think all night, and you don't sleep, and you analyze, like, cartoons that have nothing to do with anything, and you want to tell your friends about the cartoon you watched and the tsunami, and it's not a funny joke to them. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, I, I spent all night on this on this essay, and they're like, you're crazy, and fine, I'll be crazy. I'll be all of that, because I'll get to where I am right now. So on July 3rd, 2003, after all these great accomplishments and great failures that I never took credit for ever, even like most of my sobriety, I killed myself on heroin. Something I thought I'd end up doing when I was like playing lacrosse with all the preppy kids, no. But I did it because I hate feeling, and I hate it now, and I hate the fear, and I hate your eyes looking at me, but yet I love it, just like all of us. It's the hate love of feelings that we all have. We all want the ups and none of the downs, and that's me. I want all the pluses and none of the minuses all the time. And in fact, I want more pluses, more of the time. And if, if God, whoever's dishing it out, can dish it out, I want to talk to him directly, and I want him to hook me up and fly me over where I, where I can pick it up and have control of it so I can give it to myself. It's insanity. So, but it's, it's how I am. I don't like feeling, you know, but I've learned through sobriety to do it because without the grace of, of, of AA, who I just clown on all the time, just like, I hate this, I hate that, as I break my shell, of course, whatever. But uh, it's just, I, as I clown on AA all the time, I can look back tonight and remember specific incidents as I've seen specific people in this room tonight as I've run in and out of this room since like five o'clock tonight and get phone calls with people telling me that they, they love me. And Happy New Year, even though we don't celebrate New Year, or whatever, I'm just like in awe. Because if that's not God, I don't know what it is. Because 
For me, what AA has done is it's taken a little boy as big as I am, and it's, it's, it's made me face myself. And that, that process, without my mom here, with no money, with any of that, I have a book and a cell phone, and I work with kids all the time. That's why I'm like, thank God, they're drawing. They're not even listening. I love it. It's just the best. But it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's an experience that I can't explain, and that's how I know it's real. Because I've been able to talk my way in and out of every situation that I've ever been in in my life, and I can't explain AA. So I'm not going to try, and I'm not going to think about it, because I have the most amazing feeling tonight. So I kill myself on heroin. I don't remember it. I called my mom. Of course, she's my higher power, right? I guess. No. But uh, she, she took me to the hospital, and I checked myself out of the hospital. I mean, I knew how to talk, I knew how to talk the doctors out of letting me out. I mean, bleeding, I was, I was pissing urine for over a week. You know, my, my girlfriend, it was her fault for a long time, too. She pretty much hands me over to my mom because that's what you do, I guess. And my mom hands me over to the doctor, and the doctor's like, we want to have nothing to do with it. I checked myself out. Had no idea about the disease of alcoholism. I swear if I would have had real information then, I probably would have run into these rooms. But instead, with all the self-will that I could, I laid on a couch, and I kicked heroin with no meds, no drugs, Nothing but the worst feeling that I've ever had in my entire life, and that's what keeps me sober sometimes, is like, Jack Daniels is like, that was staple, you know? Heroin, staple, whatever it was, staple. Anything not to make me feel, I hated beer. Why drink beer? It takes too long. It smells better on my breath to girls anyway if I'm drinking Jack, you know? And I pass out, and I don't remember it. Fine, it's all good to me. So I thought, until I had to face it for real, so I check myself out. I kick for 30 days. Don't get a 30-day chip. Whine about that right now. So, so I'm laying on the couch. My mom won't have me in the house. I'm not allowed to go back to my house because I totally had this drug pin going on. And I had a reputation to keep. My mom has a reputation to keep. My dad's like, I'm an alcoholic and I'm sober. I'm out, you know? Whatever. I love him to death. I'll tell you how I got to talk to him, too. Um, so I asked for help. And I've asked for help once in my life for real and thank god there's real ears to hear that and i got shipped off as i usually do because nobody wants to deal with the problem and i especially didn't learn how to deal with the problem being shipped around the state all the time all over the country on other people's dime because i'm smart because i'm athletic and i ended up in la and i got to la and i met this big punk and i mean it's it's been my lifelong dream i had been tattooing myself since i was like 11. You know, they call it cutting now, whatever, I don't care. I have tons of tattoos. So I meet him, and he didn't patty cake it at all, but at the same time, he didn't dismiss me. And for, for a short amount of time, he showed me enough that I could hold on to, and I was still holding on to other people. I was still holding on to outside things that, that had no real power. But he allowed me to do it because it kept me sober through those days. But he only allowed me to do it up until the point that it was healthy. And that's not very long. And then he cut me. And he showed me the book. And he showed me the 12 steps. And the hardest thing about these 12 steps, if you're smart, is that you want to intellectualize it again. And you can't. I can't. I can't explain them. I can only do them. And I can only show people how they've worked for me. And that is a feeling that, that ice cold heroin running through my veins just doesn't do. It doesn't do it. So this man did not carry me. He told me, I did not save your life. And I didn't understand what he was saying, but I read that book enough times to now understand what he was saying. And through that, I was just given enough, enough, not more and not less. I was given enough love to really love myself and not be able to question it. And I met more people and more people. And my grandma said to me last week, she said, Cullen, you've always been alone. And I have always been alone. I've always been a loner. And I'm definitely not alone now. And it's not just people. It's a presence, you know? And it's always with me. And, and I get scared, and I talk about it. And they call that schizophrenia, but we all know that I'm not, you know, that's, it's called prayer. You know, sometimes I talk out loud with the music up real loud in my car, but whatever. And it just, it, it, it's been an amazing experience. I, uh, I got to go to UCLA, ran out of money. Fine, I'll reapply with student loans, and I'll do it on my own. 
and I haven't asked anybody's permission to do that, and I has I haven't asked anybody how to do it. I uh, I'm part of a business that that is just my lifelong dream, and uh, in the past 24 hours, I hadn't spoken to my father in about four years. Probably hadn't seen him in eight, which is pretty much his sobriety, I think. I called my dad with the biggest news of my life, and he cried, and he really like he he cried. You know, and uh, I don't like feeling my eyes just welled up and I'm fighting it, but whatever. And uh, then my my mentors all called me. My friends all called me on their own will. I hadn't made any phone calls today. I didn't tell anybody except for one person that I was speaking here today because I was scared because I felt the change. I can't just look good anymore. And I can do that in AA. A lot of us can, you know. And then something happens if you really put something into it and you allow a little bit of patience and a little bit of time and a lot of feeling. It doesn't have to be good and bad. It's just a feeling. And it's uncomfortable because we don't know how to do it. And I don't know how to do it. So he calls me and he tells me that he looks up to me. This man is 46 years old and he runs with something that I would consider to be a dream. I coach, uh, coach middle school lacrosse. I, uh... I'm also going to apply back to school. I have, like, this much finished finished school. And uh, these are all things that literally up until a few hours ago I blamed my parents for. But now I get to look and see that I was carried. I can tell you that, honestly. I was carried. And I was carried by anonymous people and random people who I consider friends in these rooms and out of these rooms. And sometimes I don't like all of you, and that's the truth. You know, and don't, there's a lot of people don't like me. That's fine. Right now, you know, it wasn't. But I, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back into to wilderness experience. Probably get my EMT. Uh, the one thing that I do remember, I, I really don't remember a lot about my childhood or my life. I mean, I told you pretty much what I remember. Is that I remember telling uh, my mom that all I wanted to do was help people. And, you know, I crippled myself from ever, ever being able to do that. And it says that. It says that um, on page 86, I believe. It says, if we drift into morbid reflection, remorse, self-pity, that we're of no use to anyone else. And I lived my life like that. On my, on my knees, even in sobriety, I lived my life like that. That I was never enough and that I would never be enough. And that... That is what drove me to drink, because how could I ever have enough if I, myself, and nobody else, just anonymously and with their own experience, believed that I could too? It's not something my mother could have done for me. It's not something that my grandmother could have done for me. It's something that literally the people in these rooms have done for me, and I'm not a real sappy, dappy type, you know? I'm not. Um, I, I don't know what came over me. I don't know how. I don't know why. That's my biggest problem when I start asking why. Um, the way I work my program just happens to be the way that other people work their programs who have more experience than me. And that's it. And most of the time, I get no phone call back or a message referring to a page in the big book. And that has led me to a real higher power. And uh, the loner kid has, has now become a man who's willing to be alone knowing that I'm never having to feel lonely. I literally want to go into the woods by myself and grow the beard and do the whole bit and drink water and eat nuts like all the sappy like hippie what whatever's. I love the woods, you know? I do. And kids always relate to me and I love that. I love kids. I I love them, you know? Uh I I've, I've seen so many shrinks in my life. It, it, it like hurts my head most of the time. And they always used to refer to it as the Peter Pan complex. And my story about that is, uh, you know, my mom is real prestigious, my dad, whatever. And uh, I had a lot to live up to. So how I spent most of my childhood was in a fantasy land because I didn't want to feel. I read every book in sight. I watched every movie, memorized it, got to meet a lot of the people out here. They're not as cool as I thought they were, but that's all right. And uh, my mom used to just like call these random babysitters to like come watch me. And I don't blame her. She's doing the best she can with what she got, you know? She's got to live her life too. And I got two siblings. I got all sorts of siblings. It's like, 
she calls my house one night. She's at a big ball. She says, uh, is Cullen there? The babysitter goes, who? She said, Cullen, is Cullen there? My son. She said, oh, you mean Peter. No, Peter went to bed a long time ago. She said, Peter, you know? And it was a running joke, but she kept calling the same ba different babysitters, you know? And I got away with it. I wanted to be Peter Pan. But the thing I remember about Peter Pan is that he actually, like, decides to live real life, you know? And I'm not really, like, gung-ho about it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a cheerleader, you know? I'm a lacrosse player. It's like, I'm just joking. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I know there's going to be ups, and I know there's going to be downs, and there's not really anything other than alcoholism that, that can diagnose my ups and downs. It's not very normal for a 20-year-old 20, 20 kid to die of an overdose, have had 15, 51, 50s, five arrests, you know, like talk about Canyon City. It's like, that's not normal. That's not normal. But that's my experience, and I, I wouldn't give it up. Today, I wouldn't. Yesterday, honestly, it was a different story. And, and for me to be able to explain what happened in between that time is all summed up in that stupid, it's not stupid anymore, I used to hate it. You know, don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens. And uh, I am a miracle, and we, we, I can say we all are, you know? We seriously all are. I've had a lot of accomplishments in my life that I've never owned. And it's time that I get to take responsibility for owning those as well as working on my defects of character and helping other people because that really is my dream. And I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a speaker. I don't think I'm Malcolm X or anything, you know? I mean, I'm an AA, like, not a lot to like, you know, this isn't the Harvard ball. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know. But at the same time, I'll tell you something else. Uh, in all the institutions that I've been in, including higher education, I haven't met a group of people that are smarter, more loving, more down to earth, and more real than I've met in AA. And like I said, I don't like all of you, but you all have my respect. Because I know, I know, I know, with all the books I've read, I remember the night that the words disappeared from my books is the only way I can describe it. And uh, I, remember, I remember it saying, heaven, our religion is for people who want to go to heaven. Spirituality is for people who've been through hell. And this is a spiritual program. And Tradition 3 says the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking. And I have that desire for at least one more day. Thank you so much.